Coming up on DTNS, it's Farm Day. Tractor hailing could help farmers not only get more crop yields, but better bank loans, too. Aeroponics could make your airplane food better than what you eat at home. Plus, Microsoft's attempt to secure our smart home future. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, February 25th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the increasingly lighter forests of Finland, I'm Patrick Beja. And we were just talking about horses, actually, uh, and, and all, all manner of, of farm animals. Uh, if you want that wider conversation, become a Patreon, get good day internet, patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google updated Chrome to patch three security bugs, one of which was a zero-day vulnerability being exploited in the wild. The attacks were discovered on February 18th by Clement Lassine, a member of Google's threat analysis group. The zero-day vulnerability was identified as type confusion in Chrome's V8 component responsible for processing JavaScript. Type confusion tricks software into initializing execution, thinking that the code is one type, and then changing the type to cause logical errors that can be exploited to run malicious code. Intuit confirmed that it plans to acquire Credit Karma for $7.1 billion, Intuit's biggest acquisition to date. Credit Karma lets people check credit scores, get credit cards and loans, and file taxes. It has more than 100 million registered users and 37 million monthly active users. Intuit also owns Mint, TurboTax, and QuickBooks. Samsung unveiled its first 16 gigabyte LPDDR5 mobile DRAM chips for sale built on the 10 nanometer process. It's not only more memory, but also faster, about 30% faster at 5,500 megabits per second. Also uses 20% less power than the last generation. Samsung's working on a version that's even faster too. Uh, the 16 gigabyte LPDDR5 chip is in the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra already and is now available for other manufacturers as well. Qualcomm announced a reference design mixed reality platform for the Snapdragon XR2 chipset meant for 5G enabled VR and AR devices. In addition to 5G, the XR2 can support up to seven cameras and up to 3K display panels per eye, although the reference design used 2K panels. XR2 also supports cameras that can track eyes, lips, and external space. AR2 powered devices are expected by the end of the year. Indeed. All right, let's talk a little bit more about Amazon opening a big version of its Go store. Indeed. If you're in Seattle, you might want to check it out because they opened their first Amazon Go grocery in Seattle, a 7,700 square foot space without cashiers. Amazon previously opened 25 smaller Amazon Go convenience stores in the U.S. The new grocery store in Seattle, Capitol Hill neighborhood. Uh, yes, the Capitol, Capitol Hill. That is really hard to say for me today. Uh, in <laughs> Seattle, uh, <laughs> has 5,000 different products, including meat and produce, and like the convenience stores, equipped with cameras, sensors, and computer vision to keep track of what a customer leaves this, uh, of what a customer has taken when they leave the store. Yeah, so this is uh, we we talked about the the idea that Amazon was working on something like this before, and this is the this is the test version. Uh, it's now open for people to try. If you're up there in the Capitol Hill neighborhood of Seattle, like like Patrick said, you should go check it out. Uh, it's much more difficult than the convenience stores. So they're like like you said, there's 25 of those convenience stores. Everything's pretty much prepackaged, comes in cans or boxes, uh, and it's a lot easier to keep track of. A grocery store, first of all, is much bigger. Uh, it's like a 10,000 square foot building. 7,700 square foot is in play, right? That's where the people can just roam around, pick up stuff, put it back in the wrong place. Uh, and if you look at the GeekWire story, there are pictures of open produce. So it's not all packaged up. Uh, you can pick up one apple, two apples, three apples. It looks to me like everything's priced per unit, not per pound. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the way they get around, uh, you know, having to weigh things, which would be really tricky. Uh, and I guess every apple is priced the same. I think a dollar twenty nine each for an apple. That that sounds crazy expensive, but um, but yeah, mm -hmm. but the convenience, is, is, if it works, is there. Uh, but this is this is a much trickier thing to keep track of. Obviously, Amazon thinks it's good enough to test, and they're only opening one store to to kind of work out the kinks. 
How do you guys feel about this? You know, it's funny. You mentioned the expensive apples. And for a lot of us, it's it, we're used to, yeah, you weigh produce. Sometimes it's per item. You know, like it'll be like $4 per artichoke where I'm like, okay, I'm not going to buy those. But you do, you you are used to in general when it comes to produce or cheese or meat, um, stuff that you, it's not always priced the same because it, it depends on how much it weighs. So for Amazon to be like, okay, well, we can't do that. So maybe we'll hike up the median price just across the board and people will just sort of deal with that because it's more convenient overall because they're saving time after, you know, after not having to wait in a checkout line. You know, I, I, I wish it were around the corner for me because I'd love to try it out. I, I, I think this is a really great idea. I just wonder how much the pricing is going to, is, is going to dock them because oh, it's probably going to be it, higher overall. It, Amazon, what they do best, well, there, there are a lot of things they do really well, but one of the things they do best is convenience. And the if it is indeed as convenient as the theory would make it, I think price matters a little bit less because you just go in, you don't have to worry about queuing or having cash or anything like that. Although nowadays people pay with their phones all the time. Um, but if, you know, the, the one click buy is something that actually matters, um, it will be interesting to see if that translates into real life. And if the, that kind of fluidifying the shopping experience as much as possible is going to be successful for them in, in the real world as well. Um, I think on, on the point of it working or not, it seems like... Uh, they're moving forward uh, quickly enough that if it's not working re well enough now, it will probably fairly soon. Um, yeah, they must feel confident that they they think they have a solution and they they're ready to to try it out in real life. And and if, in case somebody doesn't realize, uh, we sort of assuming you all know what an Amazon Go convenience store works like, but this is not self checkout. This is not even pay by phone. You scan your Amazon Go app as you go into the store and then you are tracked from that point on and you don't have to talk to a person if you don't want to and you don't have to check out. You just walk out with stuff and it mm -hmm. knows what you've got and charges you accordingly. There's no chance to weigh anything or or anything like that. So uh, that that's where this becomes complicated in a store of this size with, with this kind of selection. It'll be interesting to see how it I works mean out. It's not exactly the same, but the Apple stores, one of their uh, strong points is that they make it really easy for you to pay for something. You just grab it and talk to someone. You can even walk out in some cases when you use the app. Um, but that that works, and uh, I think it might here too. Well, this is way more complicated than that. Just, to, it, it, just, just because in case people are confused now, it's like, no, this is not scanning an item off the store. You don't have to do anything once you've scanned yourself in yeah. in the store. You just, you you just, just take grab it. things and walk out with them. That's well, it. Well, I think I think your your point, Tom, to somebody you know putting a potato down in the wrong place type thing. It's like that's where a lot of you know the cameras, the sensors, being able to know that all that AI is still. really yeah, important yeah. because it's like. It, it's there. <laughs> I can see it being a little problematic because people just do things like that. That's, you know, that's that's the shopping experience. Uh, Tom, on aisle two, there's a potato on the uh, tomato <laughs> display. Tom, no, it's the two. AI telling you, Tom, aisle two, potato. But Human there is no Tom. After. There are no cashiers. <laughs> there no potato will stay. There's, there's yeah, no there cashiers, there, but there are there, actually there. humans there. Yeah, so there, there are humans there. Mozilla announced it will start switching Firefox browser users to Cloudflare's encrypted DNS over HTTPS, co commonly known as DOH, today by default, and roll out the change across the U.S. in the coming weeks. Any user worldwide can turn DOH in on in Firefox's network settings under general. DOH helps prevent ISPs and other third parties from seeing what DNS lookups a browser is making, which could make... Uh, which could be used to deliver targeted ads, among other things. Firefox will offer a choice between Cloudflare and NextDNS for DOH, but Cloudflare will be the default. ISPs have been lobbying against encrypted DNS, focusing on Google's plan to use DOH in the Chrome browser. Yeah, Google's plan's a little different. Uh, it 
will turn it on for you if your DNS provider supports it. Uh, it. It just goes based on your DNS. Firefox is providing the DNS provider for you, saying like, hey, we'll we'll give you DOH if you want to go into settings and turn it on. Or uh, as we're seeing, it'll just be on by default for Cloudflare. You can change it to somebody else if you want. Uh, so this is, this is a significant step. Firefox doesn't have the market share, so the ISPs aren't quite as targeted on them as they are on Chrome. Uh, but it will take away a data stream from the ISPs that they are beginning to monetize. I wonder how important it really is. I know it is because I've been told told it is, but I don't know how. You know how two much ISPs? You mean? No, like actually, yes, to have. Uh, uh, to make sure I'm actually talking about the fact that you need your DNS over your DNS to be encrypted. Oh, how important uh, it is to us to it. have it encrypted? Yes. Um, yeah. Well, th there could be man in the middle of tax, domain hijacking, some really nasty stuff. And then there's a lot of people just general privacy concerns, right? But but yeah, there's some nasty stuff that can happen uh, that this makes impossible uh, to happen. So it, it reduces the attack surface area. All right. Microsoft built an end-to-end -end secure IoT platform called Azure Sphere that is now in general availability and ready to scale for any size customer. Azure Sphere combines a secure system on a chip, a secure operating system, and a secure cloud service. Uh, let's start with the chip. The microcontroller design isolates each subsystem securely from each other. Uh, the hardware-based Microsoft Pluton security subsystem protects against tampering. An Azure Sphere microcontroller then boots into a hardened Linux OS. A lot of people made a big deal when they first announced that this would be Linux because it's not Windows. Uh, the Azure Sphere security service in the cloud checks that the device is only booting with genuine approved software and then provides a secure channel for operating system updates. All of this, if you're like, I'm a little lost, all of this minimizes the risk of infection so that your IoT devices don't get infected with malware. Uh, it keeps devices patched and up to date, which limits the chances of other kinds of infection and uh, makes makes things secure so that you don't have to worry about the devices you're using. Now, granted, Azure Sphere is probably gonna use, be used most in the enterprise, but security is a huge concern there as well. Uh, MediaTek is helping design and build the chips. Qualcomm is using it for 5G and NXP is building a certified crossover applications processor. You know, Tom, you mentioned people, uh, you know, to kind of waking up when they were like, Linux? What the heck? Uh, what, why, why would Microsoft do this? Oh, that's why? old news. Yeah, that that's that was that was last year that they announced this. And and the reason they're they're using Linux is it's the best operating system for mm -hmm. this particular application. And Microsoft has now years ago abandoned the idea of saying, oh, we have to make Windows do everything. Uh, they're, they're willing to say like, oh, if there's a Linux version that fits purpose better, we'll use that. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems, yeah, it would be difficult to fit Windows into that kind of application, it seems. Maybe it isn't, but that's the impression. I, I you know, they've had embedded Windows and they still do. Uh, but I think they're, you know, like you say, Patrick, they're maybe just not really that great <laughs> at that, that sort of thing. And <laughs> And uh, under such an Adela, Microsoft has said, well, we're going to make this, uh, we're going to make money off of cloud. Uh, so let's not get all hung up on whether if forcing Windows onto a microcontroller if Linux works better uh, and we and we feel more confident we can secure that. Yeah, and, and on the uh, concept of the actually having a, a ready-made system to secure I IoT devices, it seems like this should have been created by someone <laughs> already. Um, and it's surprising that it's taken so long and that Microsoft, I mean, I'm sure there are some systems that work sure, sure, uh, yeah. better than others. Um, but it is, but it, it's, it's, it's like we could have used this a while ago, but, you know, I guess not all the horses are out of the barn, so why not still fix the door? Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and, and Nadella has been talking a lot about the fact that, you know, there are a lot of, uh, uh, computers and a lot of mobile devices, but if you compare that to the number of IoT devices that are going to be uh, uh, in the world in the next few years, that's that dwarfs the in terms of numbers, it, it dwarfs the existing uh, devices, and so that is definitely an interesting way to approach trying to conquer that um, that that ecosystem. If is uh, providing security, which is what is definitely missing in that space. So I think this yeah. is an interesting one.
Bruce Schneier calls it like a wor worldwide robot, <laughs> the, the Internet of Things. Yeah. It's scary. It can be scary if it's not properly handled. Google announced three new Stadia Pro games instead of the expected two. Racing game Grid has a 40-player 40, 40 endurance mode exclusive to Stadia. There's also a role-playing card game, Steam World Quest, Hand of Gilgamesh, and Steampunk platform, Steam World Dig 2. Two titles dropped out of Pro, leaving a total of seven titles. Hmm. So, Stadia is still being Stadia. To someone who doesn't follow games specifically this might seem oh that's cool i'm getting three games instead of two those aren't going to set the world on fire so <laughs> you know, they're okay but um the the launch even by everyone's expectations which were pretty low the launch and following um months of stadia have been very disappointing i even uh unsubscribed which is very surprising for me. Um, I was sure that they would give uh, subscription additional months to, to people who had been their founders. I guess they didn't. And I think even though it's uh, disappointing, it's because they know that, again, as we've been saying from the start, the real launch is going to happen when they launch the free service. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's still a few months away at least so anything that happens before that doesn't really matter and um, since we're talking about st game streaming uh, Nvidia's GeForce which has some very uh, uh, good features has been losing a few big uh, high profile um, developers and publishers who are saying we don't want to be on your platform anymore so Again, that also, I think, is a pretty good sign because it means they are getting serious and they want either to license their properties to those platforms or to make their own. So I think it's actually a sign that things are moving faster than we might think. And that's why we want you to tell us all this stuff, because, yeah, that's that, that's interesting. And and we're we're still it sounds like a ways away from this really being the thing that everybody was hoping that it would be at the beginning. So if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, keep up to date, subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. We got some farm stories for you today. Deer and company, the folks who make the John Deere tractors are partnering with Hello Tractor, uh, an app maker and cloud service provider to make John Deere tractors available on demand for farmers in Ghana and Kenya. So it's a tractor hailing service. Uh, Hello Tractor lets farmers hail a tractor when they need it using an app that then monitors the usage and fuel levels for them. A black box is installed under the dashboard of the tractors, and that's what keeps track of all that stuff. Agricultural services firms like Agrimec Africa in Nairobi uh, manage a lot of the deployment of the tractors. They've, they've agreed to let these black boxes be uh, put in on their tractors. They're already in the business of renting out tractors uh, to farmers and sometimes just operating the farms for farmers. First test of the partnership is using 400 tractors. If all goes well, the company plans to expand in the second half of the year to more countries in Africa. Deer also believes, and this is where it gets interesting to me, that it could boost sales of tractors by letting farmers make use of that information they're tracking to secure bank loans. Around 80% of cropland outside of South Africa is cultivated by hand, so making tractors easier to uh, get a hold of could increase yields substantially. And one of the ways they think they can do that is, look, farmer has no credit history. It's going to be hard to get for the bank to take a risk. But if they can go in and say, look, I've got data you know, verified by these independent companies that show I was doing this kind of farming for this long with these yields, uh, that might make uh, some banks be willing to say, OK, that's that's a better risk. We'll give you a loan. Yeah, that part is really fascinating. Um, yeah, this is this is one of those use cases where. I never would have thought about it, but it makes perfect sense. Uh, especially if if all of that if, if all of that labor is happening by hand in in many parts of of Africa, and the fact that a tractor would be able, you know, a farm would be able to be like, look at look at all the work we did because we you know we have we have this we have this uh, you know rented equipment um, and can get uh, loans in order to ramp up production and. And and do more things. That's that's really cool. It's uh, essentially uh, not Uber, but probably Airbnb for tractors. Yeah. Is, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a little bit Uber, a little bit Airbnb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and we we see those things, and and we look at it and we're like, oh, wouldn't it be great if we had like 
Uber for, I don't know, cats or for <laughs> my TV. And it's like, no, these kinds of innovations, what they're really great for is getting farmland cultivated by uh, machinery uh, where it needs to be to be uh, done better in that way. So this is really, and, and it's funny because anytime I hear the name John Deere, it's because of the fact that they fight uh, repairs on their <laughs> on tractors. DRM. Yeah, I know. So they much. have a pretty bad, bad name on that. Yeah, exactly. And here it's such an innovative and interesting way of looking at a problem, it's almost difficult to reconcile the two identities of, of John Deere. <laughs> yes. Turns out companies are made of a lot of people and have differing qualities depending on, on what they're engaged in. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 you know, I think if someone's not quite clear here, a company like Agrimac Africa already without John Deere's involvement, without Hello Tractor's involvement, we'll go out with certain farmers and say, okay, we'll we'll provide the equipment and operate uh, the farm for you. What this does is it allows a farmer who can't afford that full service to go to Hello Tractor and say like, all right, if I had a tractor for these three days or this week, I could afford it and it would help a lot. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna on demand, get that tractor out here and use it. And then they could take that data to say, look, I was doing this by hand, and then I was able to afford a week's worth of tractor through Hello Tractor. And, and look what it did to my yields, Mr. Bankman. Will you please give me a loan so that I could buy my own tractor and look what I could do if I had that. And, and that's, that's pretty powerful if it works. Absolutely. Uh, Singapore Airlines is buying food from a farm in New Jersey that's in a warehouse in the city. Uh, it's a hydro, or I'm sorry, it's an aeroponics company, uh, Aero Farms, which provides fresh vegetables on flights. Quartz notes, uh, typically salad greens are harvested about three to five weeks before they're served on a flight. So when you're eating that salad, it's not particularly fresh. You may have guessed that based on the salad you ate on an airplane. Aero Farms makes it possible for the greens to be harvested hours before being served in the air which means it's fresher than a lot of the produce you're going to get in a grocery store. JetBlue already does a similar thing. They use a rooftop garden at JFK Airport uh, to be able to serve fresh uh, vegetables on their flights. Uh, but AeroFarms operates the largest indoor vertical farm in the country from that warehouse in Newark. So they can provide a lot more than that rooftop farm at JFK can. Aeroponics grows vegetables and tubers and, and other things like that in the air, using sensors, fans, sprayers, and LEDs to precisely control the growing conditions. It offers 300% more efficient growth rates than standard crop yields, uh, though it does use a lot of power. So that, that crop yield is like based on the amount of water and things that you'd have to put on something in the ground because they can be so precise with the sensors. They save a lot on that. Uh, they do have to spend a lot of money on the computers, on the data servers, on the LEDs, et cetera. But Aero Farms not only delivers vegetables fast, it can also, because it has this control, customize the growing conditions to produce specific characteristics. Like uh, uh, Momofuku in, in New York buys from a different uh, aeroponics company and asks for per a particularly firmness in the kale they want. And you could do that. You could say, oh, do you want your kale firm? You want it less firm? Do you want your arugula a little more peppery? We know the growing conditions that will turn out the vegetables that way. It also lets Singapore Airlines have more data on where and how the vegetables were grown, which saves them a lot of time in meeting the food safety requirements they have to uh, for airline food. Uh, so if you're like, hey, how do I get one of these? Uh, fly Singapore Airlines out of JFK and Newark uh, <laughs> and uh, order a salad, I guess. I am very much looking forward to uh, that technology coming not only on airlines, but everywhere. This seems incredible for everything like i i might not know how the uh production chains work and maybe i'm mistaken but it seems like this is better than most things we get even uh not on airlines well um, it's it's the 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 proximity right like you can have uh vegetables in your grocery store that were harvested uh that day that's not impossible uh, happens all the time uh, but depending on where you are that may be harder uh, and a lot of times people are buying vegetables from across the world. So they've been on a cargo ship. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where you get like the fruit that isn't really sweet because they they grow it so that it ripens slowly and all that sort of thing. Uh, so if you want really local food, having it in a warehouse that's really near where you're buying it makes it so that more of your vegetables 
and more yeah. of your produce. Fruit's oh. hard to do with aeroponics, but vegetables particularly, you could do that with. Mm. Yeah, that's what I mean. I, I, we do buy local, but this seems like it makes it possible yeah, yeah. because you can grow in any environment. Uh, you Imagine don't the oh soil and the. Yeah. Uh, take an aeroponics farm, hook it up to an Amazon Go grocery store, <laughs> and have the robots just go and get you your arugula, Ooh. like fresh off the vine when you want it. Mm -hmm. Oh, before you want it because it's Amazon. It knows that right. you will want it. So as it's soon as you scan yourself way. in, they're like, "Oh, that's the arugula buyer. Let's go get him some fresh arugula." Mm -hmm. Do you want the pe oh? He always gets the peppery arugula. So make sure we have that one. But, but once uh, every third uh, shopping trip, it will offer you the uh, <laughs> slightly different one. To you know, it's the recommended. Yeah. Uh, we see you like this kind of arugula. Would you like to try this? Would one? you like to try buttery arugula? Uh, <laughs> Do you know there's arugula shortage right now because of because of the growing conditions in Arizona? Uh, I just bought arugula yesterday, so glad it hasn't hit me. <laughs> I'm glad you're wealthy enough to be able to afford that arugula. <laughs> it's just you know. It's well, uh, I guess. <laughs> Who knows how old the arugula was? You well, Tom. Uh, we're going to have to have a conversation after yeah. this. <laughs> I'm very, very wealthy. Yes. <laughs> Obviously. But you know, it, it, it's funny. Before we move on, the story is interesting because. Uh, it, Plain food historically is like, we all laugh, like, ha ha, it's so horrible. If you're in first class or lucky enough to be in first class every once in a while, it's a little different. Assuming that this is going to be for, for the entire cabin, or that's the idea, that's awesome. But, you know, we, we've also gotten used to uh, airlines making you pay for every little thing that you get. It's, it's very rare that you get anything free besides peanuts, which is going to, you know, give somebody a life threatening allergy anyway on the plane. Um, so... I wonder what, like, the idea of making food better on planes is great, but what happens to the consumer at that point? Prices get higher. Uh, maybe, maybe not. This may be cheaper. Uh, this the, because of the 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 time savings in the tracking on the food safety, uh, because of the the fact that it's local and so it doesn't have to be shipped very far. It's possible. I'm not guaranteeing this, but it's possible yeah. it ends up being cheaper. Uh, and honestly, I don't think my guess is this doesn't affect it. Uh, the, the, whether they charge you for food or not on an airplane entirely has to do with them trying to set fares, not with the cost of the food. Sure. Uh, so I imagine that economy, you're still going to have to pay for that wrap, whether it's got aeroponics lettuce <laughs> in it or not. And first class won't like, that's just not going to change. Right. Well, or thanks everybody who participates in our subreddit, whether you fly first class or not. You can submit stories and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and join in the conversation in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. What's in the mailbag today? Well, you know, it's not really a mailbag, but I thought I thought I would just remind folks, Patreon uh, folks, you already know this, but we have Threadwire cross posts from Shannon Morse that come out each week, focusing on security and privacy and how to keep yourself safe and how to be how to be woke. And it is second to none. She does a really good job. Um, some of my favorite content each week. So this week, Shannon focuses on car hacking, all sorts of things that happen in the automotive industry and what to look out for. It's good stuff. You can get all the deets at patreon.com slash DTNS. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Justin Zellers, Tim Deputy, and Kevin S. Morgan. Also, thanks to Patrick Beja. We missed you last week, Patrick. What's been going on in your world, and where, where can people keep up with your work? Uh, in my world, my son has been sick, and so I am, uh, as you might have noticed, a little bit uh, out of my element. But in my world, there's also Instagram. I've been uh, playing around with Instagram a little bit. And if you are young enough and hip enough and cool enough to be on Instagram, then maybe you should give me a follow. I'm not Patrick on Instagram, as I am in every other on every other social network. So give it a go. Excellent. Uh, thank you, everybody who supports us on Patreon. Uh, by the way, it's near the end of the month, and this is the time when we see the most people cancel their Patreons, uh, honestly, because they know they're getting close to being charged, and if they're needing to save some money, uh, this the, might be the time that they decide to do it. So I always ask for people who have been listening for free, who could afford a couple bucks a month, uh, to consider joining. Head on over to patreon.com slash DTNS. 
Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday. Join us if you can. That's 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>